All right, welcome in. Lake Kick is live. It is Thursday night. It is May 28th, the year of our Lord, 2020. We have got such a jam-packed show. I'm wasting no time. You probably have already heard the news. If you're under a rock or perhaps you just have a life and don't have time to keep up with football that's not happening, allegedly, in May, JT Daniels is no longer a University of Southern California Trojan, and no longer is he even in the transfer portal. He has landed at Tennessee. Nope, not Tennessee going to Georgia. So at least we got the division right. Or did we get more than that right? That coming up momentarily. We're talking about that. Several different angles to go, many of which were brought up by you, the Georgia fan, today. So we're going to hit a whole lot of that. I've also got to go straight out to the West Coast for a second, talk about what Mario Cristobal and Oregon are doing and are in the process of doing and will continue to do. You know, they're building something out there that is very atypical of what Oregon football has been. And to be honest with you, Pretty atypical to what Pac-12 football is. And by default, if you're going to compete, you have to be atypical to what the rest of that conference has been as of late. Hey, Bama's heating up too. Only have six commits right now. I think that was right, Colin. The average star ranking around 94. I think the average player rating a little north of 94. All that means Alabama's still not ranked in the top 30 in recruiting, yet we think they're going to finish top five. So there's a lot going on there too. There's a lot going on all over the place. If anyone looks you in the eye in this industry and says, Hey, would love to deliver content, but there's just nothing going on. Slap them, virtually, of course. Can't do anything physically right now. Get that out of your life. There's a lot going on. Let us prove it to you over the next 30 minutes. Let's dive in. The big news today, JT Daniels transferring from USC to Georgia. Will he be immediately eligible? Well, as of right now at time of recording, no. Could that change by close of business tomorrow? Yeah, I can tell you talking to some people, had our ear on the ground all day, had talking to some people at Georgia, the hope is that they'll be able to hop over the same hurdles and get through the same hoops that maybe like a Tate Martell was able to do once upon a time not so long ago and get him eligible. Basically, it's like trying to nail jello to the old wall when it comes to knowing which rule is going to stand and which rule you're going to be able to get around. So listen, if I had to bet money, I think there's a half decent chance that he'll be eligible, but I don't have any inside information on that, nor does anyone else. How does this impact Jamie Newman? How does this impact maybe currently committed prospects? Brock Vandergriff, most notably current five-star quarterback in high school, senior right now, upcoming senior for Georgia. So there's so many different ways to go. And some of you even wanted to ask, is this necessary? Why are we even taking a quarterback? We've already got Newman as if the maximum capacity for good quarterback talent on a roster is one and no more. Had some dumb stuff said today. People will tell you there are no dumb questions. Yeah, there are. There's another dumb statement. Uh, What is it? If you got two quarterbacks, you don't have any. That's another stupid statement that we got to dispel tonight. So I want to kick things off by going in reverse about two weeks to the May 20th edition of the Late Kick Extra podcast. Sometimes what we like to do, like Elliot in E.T., now we don't use Reese's Pieces because we're on a budget around here, is we like to just drop little morsels as much as we can. And when we think something may happen, but we don't know if it's going to happen. So Colin's about to roll for you a clip from our Late Kick Extra podcast. That's the one that we release every Wednesday. It's the mailbag. It's your questions. It's me responding for anywhere from 50 minutes to an hour and a half so far. So this is what we said concerning Georgia a couple of weeks back. Roll it, Colin. Quarterback's key, though. And I want you to think about this. And this is something that a lot of programs are going to see happen and a lot of fan bases are going to see happen. Everyone's focused on recruiting here. That was the basis for this question. Georgia's going to recruit the high school ranks great. It's going to become really important to be able to recruit transfer quarterbacks too. Georgia has been a quarterback away from already being a national championship team. Maybe a couple of times. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. uh, All too painful memories there. This has been pretty easy for me to see coming, to be honest with you. Did you really think Oklahoma was going to be the only program that perfected this art? You have a finite amount of resources, even at Georgia, where they have the biggest recruiting budget in the world. I'm talking about time and energy. You can only be great at so many things. No program, including the greatest in the history of the sport, no program's ever been great at everything. Great at recruiting, great at X's and O's, great at developing every single position. None of them have ever been that. And so at Georgia, they're great in a lot of places. They haven't necessarily knocked it out of the park developing quarterbacks. I'm going to address the allegation that they're incapable of it before we wrap this segment up. But here's my point. Here's why I say it's been so easy to see coming. 
Think about how the landscape of this sport has changed. Think about what the transfer portal and the changes to the transfer portal have done. Think about how Oklahoma's taken advantage of it. And think about the reasons why Georgia wouldn't do that. Here's a painful reality, not painful for a Georgia fan, but a painful reality for most fans. There is not a whole lot of equality. And when you get up to the top of this sport, you don't have to treat yourself or view yourself like everyone else. Georgia's not North Carolina State. Georgia's University of Georgia. So at a place like North Carolina State, you could have a star quarterback there. You could. What you have to do is you have to go find him. You probably have to find a guy that you're going to have to invest a significant amount of time in developing. And then you could go through things the old-fashioned way, and three or four years down the road, you may have yourself a star quarterback. In 2020, Kirby Smart doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to go to Publix and go up and down every aisle and buy the groceries and go home and thaw them out and prepare the meal. He can let someone else prepare the meal, and then he can just go get it whenever he's ready. That's how quarterback recruiting is about to happen. That's not to say that Kirby Smart or anyone else, it's not to say I'm advocating for Georgia to just say, well, forget ever taking a kid out of high school again. Let's just go depend solely on taking transfers. That would be ignorant. What I am saying is when you can do it, when you can remove a lot of the guesswork of having to do it the way that you used to have to do it, and you can wait and you can see a kid a couple of years into his college career and how he's transferred to the next level, how much more maturation, both mentally and physically, has happened at the next level, and then decide whether you want him because your program is a destination and every offseason, no less than half a dozen of these guys are flirting with the transfer market. When you can do it that way, why not take advantage of it? Georgia's just going to take advantage of this. They're not the only program. I just look at them and I think about the last few years what does an elite quarterback talent do for them in these games that have been nip and tuck back and forth? What does it do for them? So now we're going down that road at Georgia. And lo and behold, today, sure as I sit here and breathe, I log on to our Dogs 24-7 message board there. I wanted to see the reaction. And most of you felt like me, okay? I'm not speaking to the majority of you. Most of you felt like me. But I saw uh, Jake Rowe fighting the good fight over there today, and I was texting back and forth with him a little bit this morning when it looked like this was going to happen. I said, man, if this happens, we're going to have a field day. I had that soundbite ready to go, and I had a lot of thoughts on this ready to go because it always seems like people want to go down the same road. You got the crowd, and I'm part of this crowd, that thinks stack as many talented options as you can on a roster and then let the chips fall where they may and let competition in its purest form sort it out on the football field, not in a headline, not in a preview magazine. That's not where championships are won. They're won on the field. That's where competition happens. That's where you decide who the best is. But sure enough, as much as there may be a lot of us in that camp, there are some in the camp that says, this is risky. No, it's not. But they say, this is risky. We've already got a quarterback here in Jamie Newman. How many snaps has he played for you? The next one will be the first one. But I digress. Allegedly, you have what you need there, according to you and Jamie Newman. Why would we potentially upset the quarterback room here? That is a very soft mentality. It's just soft. For lack of a lot of better terminology that you're probably thinking and I'm thinking, but we can't say for certain reasons, it's a soft mentality. And it's not the way competitors think, and it's not a championship culture, and there's never been a program in the history of mankind, nor will there ever be, to win a championship that tiptoed around adding certain guys to the roster because they were afraid of how many feelings would get hurt. That's not how they do it at the big boy programs. That's not how Smart's going to do it, whether you like it on a message board or not. I can assure you of that. But think about this for a second. Think about the chemistry, okay? Just from the standpoint of whether it messes up the chemistry and psyche of your quarterback room. Are you trying to go seven and five? The answer is no. Do you want nine and three? Is that the neighborhood you want to hang out in? At Georgia, the answer is no. You have championship aspirations. That means you got to have a championship culture. If you've got a quarterback room that is so delicate and so fragile mentally that merely injecting competition into it could fracture it, what kind of culture did you have to begin with? The answer is a crappy one. The answer is one that you were never going to win a championship with. So by default, 
this doesn't hurt a championship organization. It only bolsters the opportunity to win a championship because by default, again, if you got the right culture in place, if you got the right topsoil, the more seeds you throw into that topsoil, the better chance you have of growing something that looks really, really good. That's all they're trying to do here. That's all Kirby Smart's ever going to try to do. So then I get another question. Why take a guy that's running from competition? He couldn't start at USC, which is a lie because I've seen him already do it, but he couldn't start at USC. He's running from competition. Why are we taking a guy? And these are, in fact, one of these people in particular, now this is in the text message inbox, not uh, on the Dogs 24-7 message board, but I sh I'm hearing from a guy today that is spewing this that also yells about Justin Fields. Ironically, Justin Fields, the guy who left Georgia because he wasn't starting, and went to Ohio State. Has anyone checked on him lately? Has anyone see, Colin, how'd Justin Fields do last? Do we have a report on how Justin Fields has fared at Ohio State? Did Ryan Day keep him around? Did I get, what did he run, scout team up there or something? I, we'll, we'll look up how Justin Fields did. College football playoff, Big Ten championship. That's fascinating. Well, for a coward who ran away, I can't believe he was capable of that. How do you know it's competition he's running from? Maybe it's just a terrible situation that Southern Cal is running from. Have you looked at Southern Cal lately? Does it seem like there's stability out there? It could very well be he assessed the situation, said, I don't think I'm going to start here. I'm going to head to a place that's more desirable. It could be on the up and up. Everything could be as it appears. Or, as is the case about eight times, nine times out of ten in these kinds of situations, there could be several other factors in place that you nor I know about, nor will we ever know about because it's really none of our business, and it could be that JT Daniels comes in here and lights the world on fire. Hey, it could be that JT Daniels comes in here and isn't eligible to play this year. Hey, it could also be the case that he comes in here, is eligible to play, and Jamie Newman's just that good and he beats him out. Either way, we've put the most options as we can, talented options, in the quarterback room, and we have let competition sort it out. Now let me get to the third thing that I saw, and this one almost made me throw the phone today. You ever hear some of these sayings? that I don't know how they get popular, and I don't know how they inject themselves into the American, in this case, college football lexicon, but there is one, I've heard it a million times, and I've laughed at it every time, I heard it again today. Normally, it goes a little something like this. I don't know, you got two quarterbacks, you don't have any. I heard that today from one of my Georgia buddies. You know what I did? I hit the rewind button. I popped in the 2017 college football playoff national championship game for them, and I took them to halftime. They had just pitched a shutout in the first half against a kid that had won SEC Offensive Player of the Year honors, 26-2. and two. You remember this guy, Jalen Hurts. And Alabama brought another quarterback they just happened to have. Don't know why they were foolish enough to have two of them, because if you got two, you know you don't have any. So they bring in one. Name was Tua Tungavailoa. They beat you in overtime for a national championship game. If that's not enough... Might I take you one year later, 2018, it's the same building, SEC championship on the line, and the kid who beat you the year before is hurt, and Alabama is stupid enough to have two quarterbacks on their roster again. So by this logic, they still don't have one because they have two, and the one who they benched the year before comes out and beats you for an SEC championship. So did Alabama have no quarterbacks, or did they have two winning quarterbacks? The NFL must have been fooled. Because as far as I can tell, they just took one of them in the first round, and then they took the other one in the second round. So what's the winning formula? Is it just some tired, old, worn-out BS saying that people have repeated so much that you just blindly believe it? Or is it a better idea to have as many as you could possibly have? What if one transfers? What if they do? What if, in fact, it's probably likely the more good quarterbacks you stack on a roster, it's likely one of them will transfer. Let me ask you something. If you're scared of a quarterback transferring and you're scared of fracturing the locker, like what's the alternative? Don't go after the best ones? I mean, JT Daniels is knocking on your door and you tell him no thanks? And he asks, why? Are you full? And you say, no, we're not full. Uh, we just don't want you. Why? You don't think I'm good enough? No, we think you're good enough. Uh, it's just other reasons. It's one of those, well, it's not you, it's us. You don't not you, it's me, way to, your, your way to a national championship, ever. So this is very exciting. It sh you should be excited if you're a Georgia fan. Now, I'll tell you this. As much as I sound like I'm in the camp of JT Daniels, I'm in the camp of competition. Let me repeat. 
It very well could be the case, even if this guy's eligible this year. It could be the case Jamie Newman's just that good, and he beats him out. All I know is I saw a wild range of reaction today from a lot of people. A lot of emotion, which is understandable. Emotion is one of the best parts of this game. But think about things. Before you complain about personnel decisions, think about things, or try to at least, through the lens of a head coach, the CEO of a program, and then ask yourself, really, would you have done anything other than take this guy today and sort the rest out later if you were running the University of Georgia football program? If the answer is anything other than yes, you wouldn't be running it for long. Let's move on. Uh, we're not exactly going to stay in the neighborhood. We're going to go all the way out to Eugene, Oregon. There is something going on just as it is at Georgia. I'm about to talk about Alabama in a second. There's something going on at Oregon. This one, to me, is pretty clear to see, too. I don't think that Oregon is garnering enough national attention at the moment because they haven't won a national championship. Uh, they're in a watered-down conference at the moment. The Pac-12 is not widely respected nationally, but I don't care what conference you're in. I don't care what conference sticker you have on your helmet. I just care about you as a team. A lot of times I talk about not viewing college football through the lens of conferences, but rather through the lens of 130 independent teams. I know conferences exist. I know they have their purpose. But for the sake of Oregon right now, the fact that Washington State isn't going to get it done this year or that Cal may not get it done, that doesn't impact my view of what Mario Cristobal is doing there. A lot of what this guy and a lot of what Oregon is doing transcends that conference anyway. That's the entire point I'm about to make. But we got to rewind a little ways. you got to understand... Before the Mike Bellotti era, probably even up to and including the Mike Bellotti era, if you're a hardcore college football fan, you knew about Oregon, you knew about Autzen Stadium, I mean, because you love the sport. But, I mean, outside of really passionate fans, Oregon wasn't a national brand. You knew about the Nike influence, but it wasn't really a national brand. Chip Kelly came to Oregon. There was a lot of beauty in how he got them to be the contending program, the national brand type program that they were. And the beauty was in understanding what they couldn't do. What they couldn't do is they couldn't win if they tried to implement a USC blueprint because USC had access to, well, innumerable resources, to be honest with you, recruiting, not the least among them, that Oregon never had and would never have under Chip Kelly. So he realized it's not impossible to win here. We just can't do it the way they do it. We've got to put in a system here wherein when we evaluate your three-star, for our purposes, they're a five-star. And so that's how Chip Kelly did it and ended up getting a lot of kids that weren't heavily recruited by the big boys that ended up being stars because they were stars in Oregon's system. Now, part two of what they did is they injected something really totally radical in terms of style of play to the sport of college football. There was no doubt when you turned on an Oregon football game, you were going to see something the likes of which you did not see anywhere else in America. That was what was the virtual cattle prod to the neck of the Pac-12. And then college football, he got Oregon to a national championship game in 2010. And if you believe Michael Dyer was down, maybe you think they won that national championship game. But either way, it's a miracle. It's a minor miracle he was able to do that. Well, the sport never sits still. What do we talk about? No matter how you're winning at any given point in time, if you're winning at a disproportionate level to the rest of the field, then that means you're like a submarine. And your, your periscope, your head's kind of popped out above sea level, and everyone's got their eye on you. And in the Pac-12's case, everyone had their eye on Oregon. So everyone starts to adjust from their recruiting strategy to their development strategy to their player personnel strategies defensively. Everyone's recruiting, and everyone is designing themselves to be able to stop what Oregon does. So Chip Kelly goes on to the NFL. Chip Kelly comes back, and when he comes back to UCLA... He's come back to a Pac-12 that has largely hit the reset button, and now everyone has built themselves to varying degrees of success to stop what Chip Kelly did, and a lot of people have adopted offensively varying facets of what Chip Kelly did. It's not just a Pac-12 thing, it's a national thing. But here's where the opportunity presents itself. Whereas it was like the aforementioned cattle prod to the neck when Chip Kelly got to Oregon, now it doesn't take anyone by surprise. Someone may beat you with it, but it, you don't walk off the field in stunned disbelief like, what did we just experience? You know what's coming. You have recruited and developed to try and stop it. 
And so people are largely prepared for it out there. Here's the best evidence of that that I can give you. The same guy, Chip Kelly, as I just said, is at UCLA. He can't even get him off the ground. It's a generation later. The sport didn't sit still. It evolved to stop what was at one time successful. Well, now let's think about what we have as a landscape in the Pac-12. And now let's think about Mario Cristobal. Played at Miami. He's been around the block. He's coached with the best. He has learned under the best. He's been a head coach before. Now he's a head coach again at Oregon. A couple of years in now. And basically, whereas the rest of the Pac-12 turned itself into a pinball game, Mario Cristobal's strategy, it's very simple if you look at what they're doing with the roster, is just to bring a bowling ball and crash the pinball machine entirely. That's how he's building his program. Look at the way they recruit. Look at the way specifically that they've overhauled themselves on defense. Look at how physical they play. Look at them on the lines of scrimmage. They don't look like the rest of the folks out in the Pac-12. And ironically, it is a tailor-made situation for them to succeed doing this in the Pac-12. Whereas this would have been a death sentence to try at Oregon just a decade ago. Chip Kelly came into Oregon, changed the entire landscape out there, and now Mario Cristobal's come into Oregon and has taken full advantage using the inverse of the style that Chip Kelly used. And now, here's part two of the blessing that was Chip Kelly. Because of the success they had, and because of the national brand that Oregon became, a decade later, Everyone knows Oregon. People, I grew up in Georgia. Everyone in Georgia knows Oregon. Those high school kids, there's appeal to the University of Oregon. Most, some of them couldn't find Oregon on a map, but they know the O. They know all the uniforms. They know the brand. That's what they know. And so now, Mario Cristobal has walked into Oregon, and whereas it, again, would have been a death sentence to ever try and recruit nationally a decade ago at Oregon, now, do yourself a favor. Not right now, but maybe after the show. Go pull up Oregon's commitment list. Look at last year, look at this year so far, and I can tell you it's only going to exclamate the point I'm about to make as we get closer to signing day. Look at where they're going. In fact, it would be a shorter list to name you the places, the regions they're not going nationally. They're taking full advantage of what Chip Kelly built there. They're taking full advantage of the brand that's been built there. And they're also doing it in an opposite way that built the brand. That's beautiful. But here is the real cherry on top. What we've seen a lot, Oklahoma's kind of an example of this, what we've seen a lot with more flashy type offenses, um, a lot of you would call it too much icing, not enough cake necessarily, is they're built to maybe win certain conferences. In Oklahoma's case, the Big 12. Uh, maybe in years past, what Oregon did was good enough to win the Pac-12, but eventually you're going to have to go through someone who has built their roster the kind of way that Cristobal is trying to build it now, the way they've had it at Alabama for a long time, the way they did it at LSU this last year. A lot of it looked flashy, but they were physical. They were big and they were physical. No one who's winning championships has ever substituted that philosophy. They've got to be physical. No one finesses their way to a championship. You may finesse your way to a conference championship in certain years in certain portions of the country. But as the Oklahoma Sooners have found out, there's a wide gap between getting to the playoff and winning it all. The beauty behind what Mario Cristobal is doing is he's implementing a style that transitions very well into the college football playoff. And whereas you probably still have in your mind this lower ceiling on Oregon, because ultimately you think you know they can't recruit on par with the big boys, they are. And it's not an overnight deal. They don't go from recruiting top 20 classes to top five classes, but it's a steady progression. Every year they have the national brand. They're taking full advantage of it. And there's going to come a time not too long down the road where they're going to get, I believe, in one of these college football playoff settings and they're going to be fully equipped. We're not sitting here predicting anything, but they're going to be fully equipped to go toe to toe with the best in the country. They get Ohio State this year in Eugene. I can't tell you definitively I believe they're ready to play Ohio State yet and ready to beat Ohio State. Wouldn't be the biggest upset in the world if they beat them. Game is in Eugene. Don't know how many people will be in the stands. But there's coming a time when this roster will fully reflect what they're trying to build out there and what they want their thumbprint on that program to be. And when that happens, when that day gets here, some parts of America who only casually pay attention to the sport are going to see that Oregon program in the college football playoff, and they're going to say, this doesn't look like the Oregon program I remember. Nope. Nope. In a lot of ways, they're more equipped to do some damage in the postseason than they ever would have been using the previous blueprint 
although ironically that blueprint has made this possible. Now let's transition right back to the southeast because there's a lot going on here too. I've had a lot of people, you've probably had a lot of people, and maybe you are among these people who have looked and scratched their head at where Alabama's been ranked in the national 24-7 sports team recruiting rankings. They were in the 40s as of this morning. They are sitting at 34 as we come on the air today. They got a commitment today from a linebacker out of Prattville, Alabama, who's really close to where I grew up, Ian Jackson. This guy is a, about a six foot, little over six foot, six one, six two kind of guy, about 210. Hey, let me stop and ask you something. I just gave you his measurables. Six one and a half, two ten. What position do you think he plays? Is it really easy to answer these days? It's not, is it? Here's the beauty. I've been using that word a lot tonight. And watch how Alabama's recruiting a lot of these defensive guys. I think it ties into what LSU is doing, to be honest with you. I'm going to get to that in a second. But he's a linebacker. Ultimately, a lot of people around Alabama think he'll shift inside because of the mass quantity of elite edge guys that they recruited last year. And they also will recruit this year because, believe me, they're not done recruiting defensive talent this cycle. But this is a guy I was reading the interview over on BamaOnline.com that he gave today. Those guys did a great job. They, they were way ahead of this one, been ahead of it for a couple of weeks. And he was talking about where Alabama projects him. And he projects as maybe an outside guy, maybe an inside guy, or maybe a dime back. Maybe a, we're talking about the possibility now with his physical build going into his senior year. I could be an inside linebacker or I could be a sixth defensive back. That's the difference. And we were talking about Oregon a decade ago. That's the difference in a decade ago, Alabama versus Alabama today. A, a decade ago, who did you have roaming around? You had Dante Hightower. I mean, they were going to have guys like Trey DePriest coming in. Well, that's not what their inside backers look like anymore. And there's a very good reason for that. Offenses don't look like they did just a decade ago. Who did Alabama and who have they for a long time had to build the roster to stop? Heard our Barton and Bud. Uh, the Barton and Bud show, they were talking about this the other day, made a really, really good point that has been in the process of evolving regarding Alabama and LSU. And I think it's been sped up a little bit now with what LSU is doing offensively. But let's get back to Alabama. We'll circle back around to LSU in just a second. Alabama right now, even with this commitment, they sit at number 34. So just to give you a comparison right now, how weird the recruiting cycle has been so far and how much it is going to change, Alabama is still behind SMU. Welcome to 1984. They're behind Wake Forest. They're behind Mississippi State. They're behind Louisville. Difference, of course, being they only have six guys committed. Their average player rating is like a 94, 94 and a half, something like that. Their approach has been one that has been a little bit more measured. We, we did an interview with Nick Saban last week, and we were speaking to him about how it appears he's been more measured. They didn't get guys in camp. They haven't done as much spring evaluation as they normally would be able to do. Some programs have still been ultra aggressive and taking as many verbal commitments as they can get. Alabama hasn't done that. And you're sitting here knowing full well, we got so many kids committed right now, well over two times as many kids committed to this point in the 2021 cycle as there were in the 2020 cycle at this point. If you add up total amount of kids that were committed at this point last year and this point two years ago, add both of those up. They don't equal the number of kids currently committed just for this recruiting cycle. You know what's coming. There is a, there's a tsunami of decommitments coming. We've been talking about that. But also, what's going to happen is you're going to get to the fall. Guys are going to take visits to places that they're committed to that they've never even visited. We've got kids, just in the past week, we've had, I've seen very high-profile kids committing, verbally committing, to programs they've never visited. And that's happening a lot. There are kids who are committed to places they've visited who still have a lot of official visits to take. We got senior tape that is still left to come out on guys. Do you really believe that we're not going to have a wave of decommitments? And do you really believe when the dust settles, this team led by Nick Saban, this Crimson team here, you really think they're going to be outside the top five? I don't. Maybe you do. I don't. But I don't want you to look at this class in a vacuum. I also want you to view it within the context of what they just brought in. Remember the class they just brought in. It was good for second nationally. I think they were ecstatic with it. Not only did they get the top quarterback in the country in Bryce Young, the formula that we always talk about, have the best quarterback you can possibly have in America and have the most elite guys that come off the edge that attack the quarterback that you can have in America. They got 
according to the 24-7 sports ratings, the top quarterback in America and the top player in America in Bryce Young. And if he doesn't start this year early on, it's only a matter of time until he gets on the field. They got him, but they also got Will Anderson, five-star edge guy, Chris Braswell, five-star edge guy, Drew Sanders, five-star edge guy, Demoy Kennedy, who would be a five-star edge guy if I ran the ratings council around here, probably why I don't need to be on the ratings council. Point being, they had a ton of elite talent that they brought in in this last wave, this last class, on the edge. So now, what's the next position? When you watch the NFL draft, what was the position that you looked at and you said, ooh, well, there goes Ruggs, and uh, there goes Judy, and uh, who's going to replace all these receivers? Well, they are. They're not void. They got Devontae Smith and Jalen Waddle, Mechie, guys like that still there. But then all of a sudden you look, and you got the Hall kid from South Florida committed, and you got uh, Brooks from South Florida committed. I personally would venture to guess they'll probably land Christian Leary. If I had to wager on that right now, I'd lean towards Alabama for Christian Leary. So they're loading up at that position now. It's just like pick which cupboard you want to load up on in any particular cycle. But they're not done defensively. And when you look now, go back to the LSU point I was making. When you look at how many defensive guys and how many edge guys and linebackers that they're taking last two classes, it's very evident to me that they're doing at an elite level what a lot of bad programs do. But they're doing it on the fly. Like They're doing it cruising at 38,000 feet. They are remaking parts of their defense. And they're doing it for a very simple reason. This goes back to listening to the Barton and Bud show uh, this last week, I believe it was. And you can, fi- you can find full-length versions of that on our YouTube channel here. You could also download the podcast, the same place you get the Late Kick podcast. Really good stuff. But they were kind of observing, and this is dead on the money accurate. Even though you may call Auburn Alabama's biggest rival or Tennessee or whatever the case may be, there's been one program that has consistently had their attention and garnered immense amounts of respect from Alabama since Saban's been there, and that's been LSU, because it's really been the closest to a recruiting equal and a talent equal year in and year out that Alabama's had in their division. You go into every year knowing LSU's not going to have a four and eight season. Like they, they're, they're not roller coasterish like Auburn's been at times. They're going to be there every year, even in the string of games that Alabama was running off. More times than not, those were down to the wire couple of overtime games. So, I mean, they were winning all of them, but they weren't dominating that series. They were dominating in the win-loss column. They weren't dominating 63-10 every time they played or anything like that. So Nick Saban has always had his eye on LSU. What kind of offense have you had to recruit and build to stop? It's been two back. It's been a lot of eye. It's been power, 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 power. It's been an underutilization grossly at times and mismanagement of their receiver talent at LSU. But then all of a sudden last year, the fireworks went off, and they figured it out, and they welcomed themselves into the 21st century. Well, think about being the Alabama defensive staff. You're looking around now with the way that you used to build, and this isn't a transition that just happened. I mean, listen, they started getting inside backers like Rashawn Evans five, six years ago. But now when you look around, where is that offense left? that you have to have those kinds of inside guys for. It's not there anymore. There's still physicality. Make no mistake about it. There'll always be physical elements to any kind of Georgia offense, Florida offense, Auburn, uh, LSU, any kind of offense. But now that you look at what you need at the end position, and specifically that linebacker position, it's a different athlete. They know it. I think their changes at strength and conditioning is going to help a lot here. But also, Look at the guys I just named that they brought in this last cycle. All of them are athletic freaks. All of them projected multiple positions. The kid they got today, this Ian Jackson cat, it's not a mistake that they're recruiting this kind of elite talent and versatility. Think about how many guys in a perfect world you could stack on your roster that you think two years from now could be playing inside linebacker or dimeback for you. They don't grow on trees. There aren't many of those out there. So Alabama has the luxury, as do about three or four of the programs out there, to stack those kind of athletes up. But Dallas Turner is a four-star defensive end that's still out there that I think they're in a pretty good position for. Uh, Jeremiah Williams is one out of Birmingham that's an Alabama-Auburn fight right now. There is a lot of transition going on for Alabama defensively. And it's needed, and I think it's going to be welcomed. But we, I was looking at the live chat. Colin and I were looking at the live chat when we went on the air. And there's always a couple of you. Alabama's tailing off. They're tailing off. 
They're not tailing off anywhere. Uh, they are going to be right there in the playoff conversation this year. In fact, I would love for you to give me the formula wherein a proven, what is he, a five- or six-time six national championship coach has the best quarterback in America come into town, has all the talent I just listed come into town. I didn't even mention the elite high-caliber backs like uh, Roydell Williams, Jace McClellan they got last year. Guys, they're loaded. What formula is there? What blueprint is there where they're not a contender? Other than emotion and hope, I need something factual. Like, I don't, I don't need the same evidence that led people to pick Notre Dame to beat them in 2012. Like, I need tangible fact and logic-based reasoning. How would I ever expect them to tail off? That's not happening. You can wish it. You can dream it. It's good to dream, but you got to wake up at some point. Go back to the uh, late kick inbox here. Oh, really? Okay, so we got a good one here. This is from Rod. Not worried at all about JT Daniels or Jamie Newman since Georgia can't develop a quarterback. You know what? Let's address this to end the show tonight. Georgia can't develop a quarterback. How do you know that? I guess the evidence you would present to me is, well, they haven't. I, I would argue, I, Jake Fromm wasn't terrible, guys. Just because you don't go in the first round doesn't mean you're terrible. Did you see that throw there? That wasn't bad. They won an SEC championship with him in 2017, did they not? They went to overtime of a national championship game with him. I assume you're going to tell me it was in spite of him. Whatever. Revisionist history has a funny way of really clouding facts in people's minds. But let's say Jake Fromm was terrible. Let's say all these guys have been terrible. How do you know they can't develop a quarterback? Who's responsible for developing? Ultimately, it falls on the head coach. But Kirby Smart's not working day-to-day -day with the quarterbacks. It really comes down to your offensive staff. How many games... Has new offensive coordinator Todd Munkin been in Athens for? How many practices has he been there for? I think zero is the correct answer. So the guy that is the most integral part of developing any quarterback you have on your roster just got into town. How do we know what Georgia's program at this very point in time is when it comes to capability of developing a quarterback? And to go back to Alabama, because we were talking about him for a second, going into the 2017 season, how would you have described Nick Saban's first decade at Alabama when it came to developing quarterbacks? They were winning. I mean, they were even winning championships. How would you have described his development of quarterbacks? You, John Parker Wilson, Greg McElroy, uh, A.J. McCarron was a pretty good guy, but he wasn't a first or second round talent. Um, Blake Sims, Jake Coker. How would you have described them developing quarterbacks? You probably would have said poor and you probably would have said game manager, and you probably would have said they've won in spite of the quarterback position. Well, then all of a sudden, that same program and that same head coach went and got a quarterback with five stars next to his name, and three years later, he went in the first round of the NFL draft. So all of a sudden, they couldn't develop quarterbacks until they did. Now, you know what they did? They went and got a stud, and then they did what they normally do, and his talent, immense as it was, was enough combined with the structure they had in place to make you all of a sudden say, whew, Bama did a great job developing him. Well, Georgia could have, not saying they will, could have a guy, formerly five stars in his own right, in JT Daniels walk in. And two or three years from now, make them look like quarterback gurus, whereas in the past, you've laughed at him, or at least Rod has. Point is, you can't develop quarterbacks until you develop one. It's like you can't win a, you can't win a championship until you win one. Right now, people say Kirby Smart can't win a championship. Well, like, what if he wins one this year? Can he still not? It's like you can't do something until you do it. I know that sounds commonsensical, but it's reality. By the way, got a lot of you watching tonight. We appreciate that. We have had so many subscribers to our YouTube channel. I encourage you to subscribe, but also a quick reminder for the Late Kick Extra podcast, which we record on Tuesday and we upload on Wednesday. A lot of you have subscribed to that podcast. That really helps us as do those five-star reviews. None of this costs money, by the way. I humbly ask that you give us a five-star review in the Late Kick podcast feed. I know you're listening. I see the numbers, and they grow every week, so I know you're listening. So give us a five-star review if you want to submit a question. Several ways to do it. I've already mentioned those. But the most advantageous way for you is to go in the podcast feature and go down to where you can do the written review and give us a review, smiley face, thumbs up, I don't care maybe even good job, only if we do one. But then put your question in the review because that helps us two ways. It helps us in getting the feedback and it also helps me see the questions. 
and it helps you get to the very forefront of the podcast because I prioritize the questions that are submitted that way. You can also hit me in my Twitter DMs. You can hit me in my email inbox, joshpate706 at gmail.com. We've gone 40 minutes tonight. That's about the length of time that we normally try to go on this show. We'll be right back here, same time, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, Sunday night. Until then, have a great weekend. For Colin, for Aaron, and for Tani, I'm Josh Pate. This has been The Late Kick. Take care, guys. 